my beautiful friends, my name is Kim and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime stories like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks so much for being here. Today we're going to be talking about Logan Marr. Logan was only five years old when her life was taken by an actual DHS caseworker. This story is extremely horrific because little Logan was let down by the person well, an entire system that was meant to help her. Shocking is an understatement. So let's talk about Logan. Just a little warning today, we're going to be talking about another very crimey child case. If you are sensitive to said topic, I will see you in my next one. Logan Lynn Marr was born on October 14th, 1995 in Brunswick, Maine to her parents Christy Baker and John Wagg. Logan lived with her mom Christy and her grandma Caitlin Badger. Christy was only 18 when Logan was born and although she was very young, she was over the moon about her daughter's birth. With too little money and too little education, she struggled constantly to find the right job and a decent place to live. John and Christy had an on and off again relationship and by the time Logan was born, they weren't together anymore. When she worked, she made minimum wage and when she got her own apartment, she didn't make enough money to pay the bills. But she never considered not having her daughter Logan and she never considered not keeping her. John started paying what child support he could, but that was based on low income local textile mill work when available. Initially, half of what he paid chipped away at the standing child support that he already had and half was applied you know, to his current support. And he began to get to know young his young daughter, Logan. He took Logan for one or two weekends a month as his schedule and Christy's living situation allowed. She and Logan were living with her mom and Christy said her and her mom fought all the time, usually over how to raise Logan. When I used to stand up for myself, she used to get so mad, you know, and well, then you need to leave. You know, one of those attitudes. Then I'd leave and She'd call the state. She said after one of those fights, Christy decided to move out, and her mother, Caitlin, was very resentful. In 1996, Caitlin, Christy's mother, Logan's grandmother, reached out to Maine's DHS office to get help for her daughter, Christy. Caitlin had never seen Christy hurt Logan or even be rough with her, and she did not want DHS to take Logan from Christy. She just wanted help for Christy. Caitlin says this later, but in her, the report to DHS, she said that Christy was immature and troubled, and she screamed and hollered at Logan all the time, and when she was left alone with Logan, Christy wasn't able to handle it. When DHS was called, Christy said she knew right away who had called and believed her mother had done it out of revenge. At this time, Logan was six months old, and Christy had a boyfriend that had a substance abuse problem. Caitlin said the young man, the boyfriend, was great with both Christy and Logan, but still, she had concerns, so she reached out to DHS. The boyfriend had to attend mandated substance abuse therapy, and Christy had to do individual counseling, attend a non-offenders group, and parenting classes. Although DHS mandated that Christy had to get approval from them before bringing a new boyfriend around Logan, this initial contact with DHS, Christy says was a positive experience. She said it helped her grow up emotionally and bond more closely with Logan. She started to understand that if she wanted a different life for her daughter, she needed a different life for herself. This is the ideal situation that you want this type of outcome when you're dealing with, uh, you know, DHS in a family. You want it to be a positive experience. Although Christy did see this as her mom seeking revenge, it was a positive outcome. But at the end of the day, Christy didn't have a high school diploma or a driver's license, but she was doing everything she could to better herself. She was attending the parenting classes and individual therapy that were recommended for her. Christy stated that at some point she was SA'd, and when it happened, 
she didn't tell anyone. She said she didn't think anybody would believe her. She was still having to answer to DHS, though, and they demanded to know the name of the father of the second child, her second child, that came after Logan. Christy explained that she had been SA'd. According to DHS notes, they did not seem to believe her. They even noted claims she was ARD in her file. What they did not do was offer for any counseling or outreach support of any kind. Up to this point, Diane Sanborn had been Christie's caseworker, and although she was tough, she was always fair. Now, though, she got a new caseworker, Allison Peters. The tone of her interactions with DHS turned adversarial. During this time, Caitlin, Christie's mom, married Mitch. Mitch had been convicted years earlier of essaying a teenager. DHS learned and advised Christie Christy that she could no longer have have contact with her mother while she is married to that man. Christy complied with this, but many of the DHS records at the time note that it was very hard for her. She was raising her young child alone and had no other family to count on. She didn't have any close friends and honestly was just lonely. Eventually, Caitlin and Mitch would split up. So one day, Christy left Logan at her mom's house with a babysitter while she had gone out for a couple hours. Mitch happened to show up outside of the house where he was not supposed to be and never actually entered the house, but the neighbors saw him and notified DHS that he was there. And at this point, Christy was six months pregnant with her second child when the report was filed. Christy said she had given no opportunity to respond to the allegation and let them know that not only was her mother divorcing Mitch, but that he was not allowed to be there. Both Christy and her mom said that the man had been abusive and neither woman wanted anything to do with him. Christy says that when her mother and Mitch split up, she thought it was going to be okay to start going over there again. She also believed Mitch showed up in the area specifically for that reason. He knew she could get in trouble with DA DHS if he was even in the area. DHS did not care and did not allow her to even speak on the matter. When Christy heard they were coming for Logan, she grabbed her little girl and got on a bus out of town. She stopped at a payphone. She was frantic, trying to find a place to go. She was a mother panicking. I, I don't know if I can totally blame her, but she had no safe place to go and she had no money, so she reboarded the bus and returned to Maine. When Christy got back to Lewiston, she left Logan with a friend and had to be admitted to a hospital for exhaustion. She was six months pregnant, working to raise her daughter and scared to death. When she was released, she contacted DHS and they demanded to know where Logan was. She told them that they told her to bring Logan to them immediately. By the time Christy got to her friend's house, DHS had already come and taken Logan away. DHS went to court and got formal custody of Logan, citing failure to protect on Christy's part. They took Logan to the hospital for an exam and told Christy if she showed up there, they'd have her arrested. To be clear, Christy had never done substances and she had never abused her in any way. I was never accused of being an abusive or an unfit mother. Just had things I had to work on is what they, how they claimed it. She was never even accused of abusing Logan, but now DHS goes to court and gets an order to make Christy go into a residential facility for unwed mothers. What? Are, you, are we living in the 50s? This was 1998. Why are they ordering her to an unwed mother residential facility? I have no idea, but that's what happened. For the rest of her pregnancy, she lived at St. Andre's in Bidford, where she took more parenting classes, relationship classes, individual counseling, adult education, and had time with Logan. Uh, when it was available th at least three days a week for these unsupervised visits. While Christy was in seclusion, Logan was in foster care, even though she had many family members that wanted to take her. Her maternal grandmother, Caitlin, had asked m on multiple occasions to be considered. She was told no, which I 
don't really disagree with that decision. Also, at this time, Logan's father, John Wagg, and his parents spoke to DHS about Logan coming to live with them. John was living with his parents, had a stable job, and there was plenty of room. Both sides of the family tried and were turned down. No one had substance issues or arrest records, nothing like that. In Caitlin's defense, she stated she had not known about Mitch's record when she married him. She actually found out from DHS is is when she did she left him and then filed for divorce but again I can see why she was a risk but the dad and the parents why weren't they considered to be able to I mean I would I would think that the dad would automatically get custody if he hasn't proven you know to not be fit so I don't know that's very bizarre but anyways although federal kinship care law mandates that states give preference to relatives over a non-relative caregiver when determining a placement for a child as long as they meet the criteria Maine rarely does so apparently allegedly in fact the state had not even bothered to establish a policy for complying with the federal law established by Congress or the state law passed in 1999. In fact, Maine DHS Commissioner Kevin Concannon has stated publicly, publicly that placing children with relatives may not be the most positive step regardless of the qualifications of the relatives because the biological parent may be in no rush to rectify their problems if the child are situated with a family member. So he's saying, yes, it's a law, but uh, I'm not sure that's the best idea. What other laws does he think? Mm, eh, it's a gray area. In 1998, Maine DHS placed only 5% of 2,998 foster children in its care with relative. In the Maine State Plan for Title IV-E of the Social Security Act for Foster Care and Adoption Assistance, with which Maine is mandated to comply and receive federal funding, state DHS officials simply left blank that section, which should have contained the implementation plan for complying with the Kinship Care Act. That leaves Maine DHS officials pretty much free to do as they please. Maine does not receive federal compensation for children placed with relatives, grandparents for instance, unless the relatives are willing to become fully certified foster parents, a step not legally necessary to assume care for the children of a family members. I'm not saying that they wanted the extra funding so they didn't place Logan with the family. Anywho, at this point, DHS had given Christy strict instructions that she had to have no contact with her mother at all. Christy complied completely. Instead, she made videotapes to send to her mom. On December 8th, Christy's second daughter was born. Her name was Bailey. Two days later, Christy, her new baby, moved into a three-bedroom apartment in Auburn. DHS allowed Logan to go with Christy for Christmas and then more and more home visits with her and her mother and, and the baby sister now. There's Bailey. Wide awake as always. Say hi. It was hard, though, because Logan was only three at the time, and she didn't understand why her baby sister got to live with her mom, but she wasn't which is very odd. If one child isn't safe, she's not getting a beat. It's just the surroundings, it sounds like, allegedly. and But it's okay for the other one? I, it's so bizarre to me. But anyways, that's what happened. To make matters worse, Allison Peters had completely taken over as her caseworker while she was at St. And Andres. Allison was said to be extremely judgmental and she had no time for Christy. Christy said she called Allison every day to ask her for more visits with Logan, but Christy was following DHS directives and by March of 1999, Logan was being allowed to spend some weekends with her mother and the baby sister. Go give us this, I can. 
that girl. In June of 1998, a year before Logan was returned, Christy and baby Bailey had moved to Sabattis to live with the man Christy was dating and his young son after getting Allison's approval. The relationship ended in August of 1999, a few months after Logan was allowed to return home. Christy and her daughters moved to Guilford, where they stayed with Christy's mother for a couple of days until Christy rented an apartment. This two-day visit with her family was counted by Allison as a move, which was used against Christy. In the DHS records, even though Allison knew about some of the vacations, she marked them as a move. Although when Christy would move, she would mark the move out day as one day and the move-in day as another. It's kind of ridiculous. In November of 1999, when Christy was 22, she left Maine with both of her girls and headed to Florida to live with her father and her stepmother. She had not always had a good relationship with her father, which I'll explain, but she wanted to work on it. DHS did not want her to go to Florida because she was going to someone who Christy had accused of essaying her as a child. She ignored their concerns and moved anyway. In an interview, she admits that she did it for selfish reasons, but she also did it to improve her life. Her father was going to teach her to drive and help her to get her driver's license, which she, which she still didn't have. Most everywhere Christy went, every appointment, she either took public transportation or had to walk. With two young children, this is really tough. So getting her driver's license was really important to her. She was hoping to get a better job and she said that she wanted to get out from under DHS. But the move was not what Christy had hoped for. Her father did not help her to learn how to drive or help get her license. She still had little education and skills, so she had minimum wage jobs and it just never covered the bills. There were also some issues between her, Christy, and her stepmother that was close to her own age. Logan began acting out because she was homesick. She missed her nanny and the snow. She missed making snow angels. Christy was ready to go too. She used her last paycheck in Florida to buy all the, of them bus tickets and return to Maine. And that was in February 2000. Christy didn't have any money, no place to stay. So her and the girls stayed with her mom and her stepdad, her mom had remarried. Christy and her mom said they remembered the first night back. Logan had taken a bath and was in her nightgown all ready for bed. She went into the bathroom and was in there for a long time. They were a little concerned and were about to go in and check on her when she runs through the house squealing with laughter and just before she gets to the door, she takes off her robe to reveal that she has her swimsuit out. She quickly puts on her bicycle helmet and runs outside jumps headfirst into a snowbank. After they finished laughing hysterical, they got her inside. It was nighttime and freezing outside after all, so she got another bath to warm up. She was just so ridiculously happy to be home. Although DHS involvement in Christie's life had been terminated nine months earlier, it seemed as though Allison was collecting evidence against her because she was getting calls. Allison was getting calls about uh, Christie, people reporting Christie. This evidence was always third, fourth hand stories. Some of it was from Christie's stepmom that was communicating with Logan's first foster mom, Karen who was then in turn calling DHS. In the meantime, Christy had met Paul Badger. He was the grown son of her mother's new husband, Ron Badger. Caitlin marries a man and then Christy marries the man's son. A little bit odd when you think about it. Christy and Paul dated for a long time and were finally married on March 4, 2000. For the time being, both couples and the two girls were staying in a one-bedroom apartment, so six people in a one-bedroom. 
but they weren't typically home. They had different work schedules. So Caitlin and Ron had actually applied for a five-bedroom home in Dover Foxcraft. The plan was for Christy and Paul and the kids to move together, and they would have the master bedroom. The girls would share a bedroom, and then they would have a playroom. Also, at the same time, Christy and Paul were waiting for an apartment they were looking at to become available just in case the house didn't fall through. So there was a couple of contingency plans. It sounds like they were just in an in-between stage. So they were all crammed in a one bedroom. Me and my sister lived together when we first moved. Um, there was my daughter, her daughter, and us two, four of us in a one bedroom. You make do when you need to. It was a cramped situation, but everybody was happy. Then on March 7, 2000, with absolutely no warning, no questioning, Allison and another caseworker, Julie Clark, showed up at Christie's home and took her girls. Allison wrote in a report to the court that in only two months after the first report, Christy had returned to her unsafe lifestyle. There is absolutely no cooperation as to what this unsafe lifestyle is. Christy at no point was ever charged with any abuse of any kind. Allison did list 17 moves in a year and she wanted to hold uh, that against Christy. Allison also said that whenever Christy had contact with her mother, it affected her negatively. It's not clear what evidence they had to support this. She also put in a report that Christy's mom had an untreated mental illness, which is not exactly clear either. Caitlin did have agoraphobia, which is a fear of open spaces, but she had been treated years earlier and would have proven that if Allison had talked to her about it. Allison also claimed that Christy's husband, Paul, beat her in front of the girls, which Christy and her mother denied. There were no police reports locally, so Allison started calling around from state to state, trying to find out more info on Paul. Wish there was more caseworkers like this. Although her motives were unclear, allegedly a burglary was in Paul's past. It had happened 10 years prior. After Logan's death, DHS would claim that the girls were removed from Christie's care due to substance abuse issues, although that was never listed in Allison's many reports. Christie's biggest sin, according to Allison, was that her apartment was too small. She made no claims that the girls were ever abused, but continuously referred to Christy and John as abusers. Once again, neither of Logan or Bailey's parents had ever been accused of any kind of abuse to the girls, not by doctors or even DHS. This time when Logan and Bailey both were taken, they go to live with a foster mom named Mary Beth. This the first night, Bailey had to be held all night long because she couldn't stop crying and Logan slept on the couch surrounded by cushions. Mary Beth took her job very seriously and kept a journal about her time with the girls. Apparently, Allison had told Mary Beth that even though no one had ever suggested either girl had been essayed, Mary Beth should still keep an eye out for signs of it. So, of course, Mary Beth saw signs everywhere in that she would report that back to Allison. Mary Beth noted that Logan asked often about going home. Her accounts indicate that she, Mary Beth, prided herself on not buying into the four-year-old's frantic intensity to be reunited with her mother. One morning, she wrote, usually we have a good morning together and the manipulations don't start until later in the day. But on this morning, Logan started right off with, do you think my mommy will get me back? My pat answer is, I don't know. She didn't get a reaction from me, so she escalated by talking loudly and nonstop about her mom right next to me. I tell her this will not work and to go into the other room and I need to finish what I'm doing. Mary Beth outlines steps she will take, including getting more support and more respite to allow her to have the patience to ignore and correct. There's two ways to look at this, for me anyways. At least she's getting support. And the second, maybe foster care isn't for her. 
And that's okay too. In the meantime, Allison put in her notes that Logan and Bailey appeared to become immediately comfortable in their new foster home. If Logan acted out, Mary Beth would threaten that if she didn't stop misbehaving, Mary Beth would get her husband to to deal with her and note that for some reason, the child, Logan, is scared of male figures disciplining her, implying that was from abuse in her past and not from the foster mother's very direct threat. During this time, Logan was taken for a physical examination as well as a forensic interview. It seems as if Allison was determined to find that the little girl had been abused in some way. Logan was once again sent to the doctor for a complete physical examination where when she shied away from the male doctor who was a stranger to her, Mary Beth noted that Logan was afraid of men and she could have indeed been afraid of men. The doctor's report was that Logan showed no sign of physical or SA. She seemed to be perfectly healthy. The forensic evaluation Logan went through was at the Spurwick Children Abuse Program in the Portland area, and she saw the program director, Dr. Lawrence Ricci. Ricci says that he examines over 600 abused children each year. It's unclear how many of of these children that he examines uh, are, are not abused. When questioned on the stand in another case, Richie stated he testified in over 300 DHS cases and he could not remember a single time he spoke on behalf of the parent. The Spurwick program reportedly received Dr. Richie's employer received more than $1 million per month from DHS. A month. Ironically, Richie is also the head of Maine's Child Death and Serious Injury Review Panel, which has, without explanation, chosen not to review Logan's murder. He has never explained the lack of action by the panel or the lack of disclosure of his own conflict of interest for payment from DHS in Logan's case prior to her death while in DHS custody. During the Spurwick evaluation, it was noted that Christy was not interviewed, and all of the background came from her current foster mom, who had only known them for two months. The evaluator also tries to malign Christy's character, first stating her husband, Paul, is the son of Christy's mother's partner. Then, in the case no one got it, the report said he is Miss Baker's stepbrother, painting Christy as a white trash degenerate to further bolster their claims. Nowhere in the report does it point out that Christy and Paul met as an as adults, as her mother didn't meet Paul's dad until later in life, a detail that would have painted a much different picture. This is what was in the final Spurwick evaluation. During the interview, Logan denied that anybody had ever done anything to her, her genitals, or her buttocks. This is consistent with the fact that she has never made any abuse-related statements. Therefore, there is no evidence in the evaluation that she has ever been assaulted. During the interview, Logan denied that anybody had ever spanked her. She denied that anybody had ever been mad at her or that she had ever been in trouble. Again, there is no historical information to support any physical abuse. Therefore, there is no evidence within the evaluation to suggest that Logan had ever been SA'd or physically abused. Still, this doctor was not about to bite the hand that fed him, and he did recommend to DHS that Logan be sent home to her mother. Even knowing all of this, Mary Beth still found zebras everywhere she looked. When Logan used Play-Doh and made a long dog-like figure, instead of describing it as a dog or a hot dog, Mary Beth described it as a phallic symbol. While Logan and Bailey were in foster homes, Christy was able to see them only through strict supervised visits. One of the guiding mandates was that Christy was absolutely not to ask about the foster family, and if Logan made any statements about the foster family hurting her, Christy could not talk about it to her with 
you know, talk about it. There was even a sign in the visiting room, visits will be ended or canceled if you do not follow the rules. A separate reminder threatens parents that if any of the rules are not adhered to, the department may pursue a motion to the court to have the visits ended. Christy was terrified of losing these visits she was getting. She wasn't getting the four visits a week that had been allotted to her, and they seemed to be canceled on a whim as it was. According to Mary Beth's notes, just before school was about to start, a terrible incident occurred. Her notes read, Logan and I had a shouting match and I threw her on the bed and held her down by her neck. As soon as I saw my hand, I stopped and I started throwing toys instead. The actual incident started with Logan being openly defiant in front of the neighbor refusing to put on her swimsuit to play uh, with the hose and then ended with her not wanting to take off her wetsuit to play inside. For the first half hour, I ignored. Then I tried to make her stay in her room to distance us from each other and then she wouldn't let me be kept following me around the house yelling no at me and I stomped up the stairs and it happened. During her tirade, I yelled, but not a yell, more like a mean voice through gritted teeth. Do you want me to hit you? After the incident, I told her that we are not going to live this way, that Mary Beth doesn't want all this crap, and that it won't happen again. After this, Mary Beth called a friend to come over and sit with her and then called Allison to report the incident. I really appreciate Mary Beth understanding that it was too much for her. I have a lot of respect for that. That's not easy to do. That night, Allison paid an emergency visit to Christy's home to tell her what happened. She knew Christy would be seeing Logan the next day and was trying to let her know in advance. Christy asked if her baby had been hurt. Why are they all just standing around talking about it? And again, and again stated her children had never been hurt in her care. The next day when she went to the visitation with Logan and Bailey, Mary Beth was there also. Christy, obviously pissed, Christy told her that she knew what she had done and she is very lucky that the children were present. Later, Christy was told that for threatening the foster mom, she was getting another black mark on her record. This would be the beginning of the end for Logan. Logan and Bailey moved from Mary's care and were sent to live with Sally Schofield. Sally was actually a Maine DHS caseworker. Now you might think, hmm, that sounds like a conflict of interest for Sally to have foster children placed in her home. You would be correct. Not only was it a conflict of interest because another caseworker would have to judge her parenting abilities, but it was clearly against DHS rules. Caseworkers were not allowed to become foster parents. Sally, she didn't care. Most people who knew Sally, caseworkers, friends, past babysitters, said that Sally was a know-it-all. She was always right, even when she wasn't. Sally had raised one son that was 14 years old at the time, and she had a second son that was only one years old. But she had always wanted a little girl. Sally and her husband took foster care classes and became certified caregivers, even though it was against so many rules. In those classes, they also had a pre-adoption assessment done. Apparently, her assessment had some critical comments, and they bothered Sally, and she complained so much that they actually removed them. One part that was removed was when asked how she would deal with a child that wasn't following the rules and was out of control, Sally said she couldn't imagine a situation where a child of hers would be that far out of control. Oh, I love people like that. When Mary Beth harmed Logan, Allison reached out to Sally and asked her if she could take both 
Logan and Bailey in as an emergency placement. Sally would later say that she was told DHS was looking to terminate Christie's parental rights, so they wanted to find a family that would take them in now and then also adopt them later. I think they were trying to avoid moving them again. I'd like to insert here once again that both Logan and Bailey had many relatives that would have been quite suitable choices, but then DHS would lose money. So they went to Sally. Out of nowhere, Logan starts having rages. Certainly with all Mary Beth's documentation, if the child had been raging, you would have known about it by now. There was, there is some cases where you could definitely tell that Logan was acting out, you know, reasonably, but it sounds like when she moved in with Sally, it turned into rage. So, of course, we need to take into account at this point, Logan had been in two previous foster homes, had seen several therapists and supervised visits with her mother, and no one else witnessed these rages. Ah, but here's a tip. If a child in the DHS system is considered unruly, you get hazardous pay. That's right, Sally applied for and received more money each month because Logan was a handful. She would say specifically three times the normal amount. When they said that she was raging and she was throwing things, and that, that wasn't Logan. That was not Logan. It didn't make sense to me. I didn't. I'm like, all right, I can understand temper tantrums. I mean, yeah, she's got them when she don't get her way. But it wasn't often. And these people are saying she had one every time she saw me. Well, what could be the reason she was doing it after she saw me? Maybe because she wanted to come home. In other words, the worst Logan acted, the more profitable it was for her and her new foster mom, who at this point had quit her job with DHS a few months after Logan and Bailey came to live with her. Sally knew the system very well with her experience as a caseworker for DHS. Relatives who helped care for Logan described a child away from Sally Schofield who was precocious but happy and overall cooperative. Sally was insistent that Logan was extremely difficult and Logan needed to be made to comply with Sally's rules. The weekday babysitter testified that Sally told her that mommies are always right even when mommies are wrong. She said that Sally said that while she had been cuddling with Bailey, with Logan, she needed to be a drill sergeant. So she could cuddle with Bailey, but with Logan, she needed to be a drill sergeant. Christy was forbidden from contact with the foster families, but she was able to at least meet most of them. She was never able to meet Sally or her family. She was never sure why they were reluctant. She wrote this letter to Sally just after Logan and Bailey were to live with the Schofields. It read, Dear Sally, Christy wrote this to Sally, her, the new family. Dear Sally, my name is Christy. I'm Logan and Bailey's mom. I'm writing this so you can know and understand my children. I thought I would let you know their likes and dislikes. Logan likes butterflies, pizza, what kid doesn't, flavored noodles, pitted black olives. She likes to put them on her fingers, white cheese, grape soda, babes in Toyland. Ah, Logan's dislikes, peas, fish sticks, going to bed early, not picking out her clothes, Bailey's likes, her brown teddy bear blanket, she takes it everywhere, including visits, dry cereal, pitted black olives, cheese, eggs, cooked carrots, Bailey's dislikes, having her poopy diaper changed, if you haven't noticed, someone taking her pacifier, fish sticks, someone feeding her, she likes to do it herself. Please ask Allison Peters what the kids are allergic to. I don't blame you for not wanting me to know who you are. I will respect that. Regardless of what you have heard or read, I love my little ladies with all my heart. I have never triple underlined, hit, spanked, or put my hands on my girls. 
I do respect my children. I am not saying you would or wouldn't, but please, triple underline, don't hit or hurt my children. The girls have already been through enough and they don't need the added stress in their life. Every night I look up at the sky at about 7.45 p.m. and I say goodnight to my girls. In closing, I want to thank you for taking the time to read this. Please tell the girls before they go to bed that I love them and give them a big hug and kiss. Thanks again, Christy. This letter was used in Sally's defense at trial to show that Christy was appreciative of Sally taking the girls. Can you imagine what a slap in the face. Just after the girls had been taken from their mom, Logan had begun seeing a therapist named Kathleen Midori. She was called as a prosecution witness after Logan was killed. She said she noticed right away that Sally wanted to exert her will over Logan as if she needed to tame her. She immediately insisted Logan call her mommy and considering that Logan, this was Logan's third foster home and she was still seeing her her birth mom, this was confusing. The therapist was so worried about this, the insistence that she contacted DHS, but they told her not to worry. Everything was fine. Sally would often call to update the therapist to complain that Logan was wetting the bed, acting out, having a hard time sleeping. The therapist advised her that Logan needed more time to adjust to the changes in her life. Sally told Kathleen, the therapist, that Logan was trying to get even and that Logan was purposely trying to disrupt the Schofield family, that it was intentional. Kathleen said she didn't think it was intentional. After all, she was going through a lot, and she was just now turning five. Sally didn't like hearing this. Sally, if someone disagreed with Sally, she is not. She is not hearing it. She did not like hearing any opinion that differed from hers. The therapist also testified that Sally insisted on being in every single therapist session Logan had. She tried several times to explain to Sally that this was Logan's individual therapy and she needed to be able to speak freely and openly during her sessions. Eventually, the therapist insisted that Logan go back to having her individual sessions with herself as she had with her in her previous, you know, foster homes, foster moms. Sally told her it wouldn't be necessary. Logan would not be returning. Sounds eerily similar to an abuser. She said Logan didn't want to see her anymore. She blamed it on Logan. Logan doesn't want to see you anymore, Kathleen. And they were both tired of the long drive. Kathleen asked to see Logan for one more session so she could address this, but Sally refused. She made Caitlin talk to Logan that same day. When Kathleen explained to Logan that she was going to be seeing a new therapist, she broke down crying while the therapist held her. This made Sally angry. Of course it did. And she yelled at Logan, you know you said that. In Logan's young life, this therapist had been the one of the few constants she had, which Sally would take that away from her. Another thing to note is that Logan had a guardian at Lighton, Lawrence Irwin, and this therapy was supposed to be mandated by DHS. Whether Sally advised DHS or Irwin about this change is not known. However, Lawrence Irwin was earning part of his salary from DHS, which again seems like a conflict of interest. However, well-meaning Kathleen seemed she was also being paid by DHS also. She and her husband had an inpatient residential facility with 12 DHS-funded spots for children. The next therapist was Jennifer Jones. Jennifer Jones received all of her information about Logan from Sally. 
It is unclear why she didn't reach out to her former therapist, the doctors, even her caseworker, Allison. Also, Christy had a long track record of cooperating fully with DHS and would have been able to provide insight and family background to those therapists, but none of them wanted to hear her input. There had been an incident where while Christy and Logan had been visiting a friend, Logan was playing with the friend's little girl. Both girls had gotten into the fridge and gotten into some jello. Unfortunately, there were two kinds of jello in the fridge, one with champagne in it and the other one without. The little girls didn't know the difference, and so they had grabbed, uh, you know, the one with alcohol in it. Christy said she immediately figured out what happened. Logan had thrown up after that, but she was fine. Still, Christy had been very upset about the occurrence. It talked about this in one of her therapy sessions. Somehow, it not only got back to DHS, but to Sally. In Sally's recounting of the events, Logan had been rushed to the emergency and almost died on her mother's watch. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Embellish much, Sally? In Jennifer's notes, it also states that Sally told her Logan had witnessed inappropriate relationships in her birth mom's home and domestic violence. This was not in any police report, doctor's report, DHS report, nothing. Most likely came from Sally's imagination. Eventually, Allison insisted that besides all of the other hoops Christy was jumping through, she needed to distance herself from her mother. Since she didn't have siblings and no relationship with her father, no connection to her mother was the only emotional support she had. Allison insisted that when Christy had contact with her mother, it affected her negatively. There were no clarification on what that meant or what Christy might have done wrong, but she followed the rules because she wanted to get her girls back. Apparently, while Sally is trying to bond with the girls, DHS decided to cut back on Christy's visits with them. Originally, she had DHS transportation that would take her to therapy sessions and the visitation, but now they decided she would have to get herself there, even though she had no car or no license. All of this was getting to Christy. She felt defeated, and she started slacking on some of the requirements. She had remarried Paul because apparently she got divorced and then she got remarried, a man that DHS had warned her to stay away from because they state there was a report that he hit Christy in front of Logan. The person that allegedly made this claim hadn't spoken out to confirm DHS's claims. It was done anonymous, anonymously and they haven't come forward. So DHS is saying that this happened. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying there's no physical person to confirm this actually happened. Christy remarries in complete secrecy and didn't tell anyone, which again would count against her. She also started missing mandatory classes and therapy appointments. One time she even stormed out of a meeting she was having with Allison. She was just completely fed up with being jerked around at this point. It was just hard to keep up with things sometimes. It felt like I was dragging all the time. I didn't know when it was going to end. But where's the end to this? You do everything and you do everything, but it doesn't seem like there's an end. <laughs> In Allison's notes from that time period, she wrote, in part, Christy's progress the past five months have been slow at best. She has missed several appointments, blaming lack of transportation. Recently, when cut off from seeing her daughters, she fell sick, not leaving her apartment or calling me for help. Of course she fell sick. I would fall sick. In her report, in Allison's report, she also wrote, Christy has on a regular basis blamed others for her problems. Can't pay the rent, no job. Can't get her GED, have to be available for my girls. 
can't get a driver's license, no one will lend me a car. It seems that even though Allison must work with families that are low income and are truly struggling to accomplish things to better their circumstances, she didn't seem to care. She just judged her for it. So, I, I mean, I get it. You, There is a point where it's like, are you making excuses for non-action or is that truly your circumstance? And I feel like more times than not, it is your circumstances. But, but Allison just didn't care. She just judged her and that was that. When Logan was murdered, records were released indicating DHS knew that Sally had been abusing Logan and did nothing about it. You see, every time Christy had a visitation, it was supervised and there was a caseworker taking notes every time uh, everything that was said and done. This is the excerpt from the supervising caseworker notes. On December 18, 2000, Christy took the holiday to her girls. According to the visit supervisor, Christy had her Christmas with her girls. As they started opening presents, Logan said to Christy, You know Sally, my birth mom. She did this to me and I cried. Logan squeezed her cheeks together with one hand to demonstrate, Logan said, she did it to Bailey too. Christy said, not your birth mom, your foster mom. Logan said, yes. Christy said, I'm sorry that happened, but not. let's not talk about it now. Let's have a nice Christmas together. I'm very sorry. And she did it to my sister too. It still has stunned me what would make a five-year-old stop opening Christmas presents. On that day, I did say what she did to me about Sally grabbing her face, making her hurt on her sister, on her sister too. As Logan was taking her presents out of the Santa bag, she explained, Mommy, you did a lot of shopping. It's almost like it's Christmas. Christy said, it is our Christmas, Logan. And Logan said, but not my home visit Christmas. Christy didn't reply. DHS received this report in writing on December 28, 2000, approximately a month before Logan died. During another supervised visit, Christy said Logan told her that her foster mom was wrapping Bailey in a blanket when Bailey was bad. Later in the visit, Christy changed Bailey's diaper and she was very upset at what she saw. It looked similar to a diaper rash. When the visit supervisor commented, to that effect, Christy replied quickly that she knows her girls and she knew that that was not a diaper rash. Christy later said that the visitation supervisor told her that her concerns would be noted. Christy then told Logan that if anyone does anything that she doesn't like or doesn't feel right, she should tell her. She told her that she could tell her mother anything and Christy would never get angry at her. Christy got in trouble for trying to comfort and be there for her daughter. Shortly after this visit, Alice sent her. Christy a letter stating she knew about Christy's concerns about her daughters and once again discouraging her from pursuing discussions with Logan. Allison wrote, she, Logan, does not need to distrust her foster home nor of the individuals caring for her. You could have very well left Logan with a sense of fear and distrust. Unfortunately, DHS never did understand that what was causing Logan's fear and distrust was being kept away from her mother and with her abusers. Allison ends the letter by threatening Christy, telling her she is trying to help, help Christy make her visits more positive so the girls and her could continue their visits. She would beg and fight with me at the end of the visit not to go back. I didn't know why. You know, she would tell me things, and but I couldn't really discuss them with them or comment on them or ask her questions. Like? She would tell me that the foster parents would wrap her, her and her sister up in blankets and grab her face. And, and, you know, she said that she would get in trouble sometimes. I'm like, you want to talk about it? She goes, no, I don't want to talk about it. It almost seems like a passive aggressive threat. On January 3rd, 2001, during a visitation, the girls were playing on the floor, making animal sounds and seemed happy. 
Out of the blue, Logan stood up in front of Christy, put her hand over her mouth and said that Derek, Sally's teenage son and mom, foster mom, Sally, do this to me and I don't like it. Christy asked her if she was joking and she said, no, and daddy held me like this, holding her arms around an imaginary bundle. Since Logan was describing what was going on at her foster home, daddy must mean Dean Schofield, Sally's husband. Christy said, what? Logan said, he wrapped me up in a blanket and Derek and my foster mom do this to me, again indicating her hand over her mouth. The visitation supervisor shook her head at Christy and the conversation ended. The report was submitted in writing to DHS on January 25th, 2001, approximately a week before Logan's death. These reports about abuse taking place against Logan went back to three months before her death. At the next visit, Logan was quiet for a moment and then said, I don't like Sally, Becca, the babysitter, or Derek, Sally's teenager son. Christy said, Sally seems like a very nice lady, did many nice things for the girls and dressed them beautifully. Logan burst into tears. Christy held her and told her she would always be there for her. That, however, was a promise DHS prevented Christy from keeping. At the January 26th visit, Christy was shocked to learn that Sally had been coaching Logan to learn that her new last name was Schoolfield. She found this out because Christy would regularly go over the girls' full names and get them to repeat it back. They also worked on their ABCs, learning to read, everything she could do to educate them and keep their minds growing. It wasn't until after Logan died that she found out DHS was trying to terminate her parental rights so that the school fields could adopt her children. Each of those visitation records were supposed to be turned into the girl's caseworker, Allison. It's unclear whether she followed the guidelines for reporting this abuse, and after Logan's death, she was unavailable for comment. When she testified, she snuck in with her head covered and came out hiding behind three big guys so no one could get a picture of her. Logan's dad, John Wagg, was also having supervised visitations with Logan. He said that for the longest time they had them meet in a cramped, dark, cold room, which resembles a prison cell. When he complained about the situation, they moved his visitation from Lewiston to Augusta, which added a lot of time to his drive each day. Then when Logan's fifth birthday was coming up, the Wack family was planning a party with the great-grandmother, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. He had gotten clearance to have Logan for five hours that day, and he called Allison about ten times a day for a week to make sure nothing else needed to be put in place. He even let them know if they needed any extra assurance, Allison, other caseworkers, uh, Irwin, the guardian, and Sally were all welcome to attend. So initially, Allison had said yes. He could have the party, then called back a few days later and said no. John said when he argued with Allison, she really relented and agreed again. So all the family members were called and the plans were put in place. Then Allison calls yet again to let him know it's not happening. He could not take her to the house for her birthday party. And you know Sally had something to do with that. She said he could take her to McDonald's close to the Augusta Visitation Center. What? But by this point, John was fed up. He told Allison she is not going to jerk him around like he did Christy. To this day, he regrets not seeing Logan on her birthday that year because it was her last. When the incident with Mary Beth had happened, John and his dad and his family went to DH DHS yet again to try to get Logan placed with them. Of course... They were turned down. His family told DHS, nothing better happen to this little girl or you guys are going to pay and you will never hear the end of it. 
His last visit with Logan was the week before her birthday. He had gotten her some sticky bugs that crawled up the wall and some coloring books. He said his favorite memory of his baby girl was from one night when she had slept over on Christmas. Logan, her dad, and her grandma were all watching The Wizard of Oz in front of the Christmas tree, and grandma had fallen asleep watching. Logan was very excited, though, and wanted to get under the tree and inspect all the the presents. Instead, he asked her to come watch the movie with him. She had been curled up in a blanket right under her grandma's chair, but the next time her dad looked at her, she was crawled up in a blanket under the tree fast asleep. She wanted to sleep under the tree. After Logan's death, Sally was interviewed by a PBS special and they questioned her about the legality of her taking Logan and Bailey into foster care. She responded by saying that she thought the guideline was that a, a caseworker couldn't be a foster parent to a child in their caseload or their district. Since Logan and Bailey weren't part of her caseload or district, she didn't think it applied to her. She also said some people may interpret the guideline to mean that caseworkers can never be foster parents, period. But I didn't think that applied to us. She said that within a few weeks of the girls coming to live with them, she found out that it was an issue. However, the guardian ad Lighten, Irwin, and caseworker Allison advocated for the girls to stay because they were doing well and there were no safety issues. And I imagine they didn't want to move her again. But no safety issues? It shouldn't matter. Rules are set in place for a reason. There is a clear conflict of interest. Of course, Allison will ignore the red flags when she trusts a fellow DHS caseworker. A total conflict of interest. Those rules are set in place for this very reason. When your co-worker, when your intentions as a DHS worker are as said, you feel that everyone around you mimics that or is at least close to it and you would never suspect your co-worker to be abusive to their children. It's a total conflict. The day that Logan was killed, it was snowing outside. Sally's husband, Dean, woke up Logan for the day and then he went off to work. When Sally woke up, when Sally first came in contact with Logan, Logan told Sally that Dean said school was canceled due to snow. It was a silly child's fib. Clever, honestly, for a five-year-old. I'm sure we can all remember saying something like this, and I doubt Logan really believed that she would trick Sally into letting her stay home. Sally called Dean at work and found out it wasn't true. She told Logan, Sally told Logan that she would be punished after school and then sent her off to kindergarten. She then notified the babysitter that she wanted Logan punished after school. But unlike when a normal child does time out, because Logan was hard to deal with, she had to double time. So if the time out was five minutes, Logan had to do 10 minutes to make up for the time Sally spent dealing with her. I've never heard of a such thing, but here is another example of Sally's punishments. In court, the babysitter would testify that was related to the school fields. The babysitter was related to the school fields, said that Sally and the kids came to her house around five on Christmas night. Logan and Dean, her husband, weren't with them. Sally explained that Logan had misbehaved So she had been in her room all day since 11 a.m. with no toys all alone all day on Christmas, the most joyful day of the year. So back to the snow day, Logan goes to school, but after Logan got home from school that day, the babysitter, Becca, reminded her that she was owed a timeout. I want to mention there are conflicting accounts of what happened on this day. But I'm just going to go with what I have. But if you do your own research, you'll see that there's, there's a later interview that says 
Sally has a different account of what happens that day. And I honestly don't believe her. So anyways, she said Logan fussed. Becca said that Logan fussed a little bit, but went to serve her time in her room alone and eventually fell asleep. She was still asleep when Sally got home. Sally said that when she woke up, that Logan was screaming. It's entirely possible that part is true. After all, this little five-year-old is in her third foster home, is trying to protect her baby sitter, sister, is trying to tell people about her foster mom, that she hurts her, and no one is listening. Sally's story at this point changes a lot. At first, she said she went into the room and very kindly asked her if something was wrong. Did, did she have a bad dream? Did she need a hug? Later, she would say that she went in and informed Logan that she is having none of this. Logan needed to straighten up right now. Stop screaming. One thing Sally had told the therapist, Jennifer, is that when Logan had these rages, she would sometimes put her in a high chair in the unfinished basement. Excuse me, you did what? It's so cruel. I get you need distance sometimes, but a dark basement and a five-year-old in a high chair? All red flags are being waved. The therapist never reached out to DHS, and I'm not sure it would have made a difference, if I'm being honest. If it were Christy, they would have revoked her parental rights, but the DHS caseworker foster mom, it's okay. But that's just my opinion. Apparently, Sally had her son take a baby, uh, baby small high chair to the basement. He placed it at the base of the stairs on a carpeted area that was well lit. That would not work for Sally. Sally moved it behind a curtain area that was unfinished with boxes and storage stuff. She placed the high chair facing the wall and put five-year-old Logan in the chair. She says she told her if she wanted to scream, that was fine. She could scream, but not upstairs. She would be making a choice to scream all alone in the basement. Sally says she comes down every four to five minutes to check on her to ask her if she's done. She said Logan continued screaming. She said at one point she went upstairs to start dinner and then realized Logan wasn't screaming anymore. She went down to check on her again. At this point, she had been in the dark alone basement in this high chair for an hour. What happened every four or five minutes? She said Logan and the high chair were over on its side. She said Logan wasn't breathing, so she called 911. Now, this is where her story changes a lot. In the 911 call, she says that her five-year-old hit her head and is not breathing. She tells the operator that she had done CPR and it didn't work. When the first responders get there, they are puzzled because Logan was cold to the touch. When Logan gets to the hospital, she is pronounced dead on arrival. The first night Sally is interviewed, she tells them that story. Then the detectives go to the house to look at the scene and want to interview her again. They let her know that they found the duct tape and they needed the truth. She says there was some duct tape, but, you know, Logan was playing with it. But other than that, she doesn't know anything about what they're talking about. The police found over 40 feet of duct tape that had been wrapped around the high chair and Logan many times. Still stuck in the duct tape is the sticker from the back of the high chair, Logan's hair, frothy blood from Logan's mouth, Sally tries to say that Logan was playing with the duct tape and did it to herself. They explain that this is impossible for her to be in the chair and wrap it around the chair. She says that Logan got it in her hair and then she had to pull it out, but she didn't even cry. The police believe that she didn't cry because she was already gone. Also found on the duct tape was blood from her mouth and mucus from her nose. The forensic examiner found duct tape residue up the sides of Logan's face as well. 
This is a DHS caseworker. Sally is a caseworker for DHS. She would have known good and well if she found out someone was overseeing a child and duct taped the child to a high chair, it would be bad. So she knowingly did this and didn't admit it. She doesn't admit it to this day. So she clearly has zero remorse. The pure evilness of this woman, what she portrays, is just shocking. So she taped her to the chair and then taped over her nose, mouth, and then taped her arms to the chair. There was no way for Logan to escape. And Sally, yes, Sally says she has no idea what happened. It was a typical time out. Please, spare me your crap. On March 8th, Sally was arrested and charged with depraved indifference, murder, and manslaughter. Originally, her bail was $500. How is that? Anyways, the community was outraged. So her bail was up to $12,500 cash or $25,000 surety bond. Dean's parents put up their house for the bond. After she was charged, the state of Maine came under immense criticism for not removing Sally's children from her home. So Sally is being charged with this and her kids are still in the home. They're not being removed. They had no problem removing Christie's kids for something that could happen. But Sally, who does it, who murders a child, DHS Commissioner Kevin Kincannon explained that taking Sally's children was not an easy matter because Sally was someone who knew the rules. Eventually, Sally's children were removed because at this point, Sally is out on bond and she's with her children. So I don't know if, if I made that clear or not. It isn't like they're home with their dad and they're not removing them. No, they're home with a potential child abuse murderer. And they're not, they didn't remove them right away. But anyways, they finally are removed. And guess what? They're placed with family members. <laughs> oh boy. In June of 2002, Sally's trial started. She opted for a bench trial, which is uh, with only a judge, but no jury. The judge concluded that she had no intent behind the death. So he threw out the murder charge. She was charged and convicted her of criminally negligent manslaughter. She was sentenced to 28 years with a eight years suspended and six years of probation. However, on appeals court throughout the sentence stating that the judge could not impose 28 years without a jury finding the crime especially heinous that it, she had no jury to be able to do that, that the judge couldn't do that on his own. Why not? That's what she opted for. They resentenced her to 20 years with three suspended. So only 17 years total. Unfortunately, she was released from prison on April 25th, 2017. This was especially hard on Christy because she was battling cancer at the time and was just shocked to find out that Logan's murder would be walking the streets again. Christy has since passed. There were no formal charges against Maine DHS for any employees involved in Logan's case, including Allison Peters or any of her other caseworkers for that matter. Allison was given a 30-day paid administrative leave and has since left DHS. Just after Logan's death, Bailey went to her third foster home, but just under a year, she was finally returned to Christy and DHS completely closed the case. It's funny, just like your teddy bear. Ooh, look at that. After the case was closed, Christy did sue the state of Maine DHS for not protecting Logan and for leaving Bailey to witness her sister's death. She did win her lawsuit, and thanks to 2003 legislation, a trust fund was set up for Bailey. 
in 2017. I don't typically go over the other children that are in the home, but Bailey has been very vocal. And so I just want to share some information about Bailey, but this isn't any information that is just readily available on the internet. So uh, and she's an adult now. In 2017, Bailey applied to college in Florida, which is so cool because that's what Christy wanted for herself. And the fact that Bailey's going on to college is, is just remarkable. But anyways, it, it, she's going in Florida where she wants to study marine biology and coastal conservation. She, she was an honor study, part of the National Honor Society, and captain of the swim team. I'd like to close with part of the essay Bailey wrote um, to, on her college application. Quote, I believe everyone has a certain person in their life that inspires them to live each day to the fullest. It is what makes them tick. A sole moment in time can be all it takes for a person's view on life to change forever. Looking back into my own past, I can quickly identify who inspires and motivates me to live my life to the fullest. It is her, the one that I feel so close to me yet nearly impossible to reach. As much as I love to feel her touch, I know she is in a place with no pain or suffering. She is the reason I wake up every day ready to fill my own shoes while attempting to fill a pair for her. My memory of her does not deceive me. Fifteen years later, when I close my eyes at night, the nightmare is still the same. The word no shrieks a small, dark-haired little girl. I want to see my mama. For the last time, it is not going to happen the woman insist while trying to stay calm. As if no cue, the lights above flicker and the snow outside is still falling fast. A blood-curdling scream starts coming out of the little girl's mouth. Losing the calm demeanor she just had, the woman shakes her head with fury. Stop this now. I cannot handle this anymore. The woman is screaming and shaking with anger. I sit as still as possible on the soft run nearby, not wanting to be noticed. Another scream is let out by the little girl. Somehow this one is louder and more powerful than the previous. The woman stands up and forcefully grabs the child's small, delicate wrist and pulls her towards the nearby door. Wide-eyed, the child decides to stay quiet, but it is still sobbing. The lights briefly flicker again. The woman opens the door and leads the child down the stairs to the basement. I hear two sets of footsteps descend down. My heart is pounding. I am frozen in place. All is quiet at first, then a violent scream starts. It is heart-wrenching. Finally, the saddest sound, one of a wounded animal that might make when it knows it is going to die. I hear the little girl's voice for the last time. It is the word, help. Everything goes silent, but it seems louder than the screams. Finally, after some time, I hear some footsteps come back up the stairs, but this time it is only one set. A single tear falls down my face. I wish I could say that this is just a nightmare and I am able to wake up from and have everything be okay. Sadly, it is not the case. This is a nightmare I will have to live with, awake or asleep, for the rest of my life. I heard my older sister's last words during one of Maine's darkest moments on January 31st, 2001. My five-year-old sister's death became national news. Her story prompted Maine to re-examine many of DHS's child and family services policies. Our own foster mother murdered my older sister, Logan. Being the survivor of this horrid incident, I push myself to my limits and strive for excellence in everything for the both of us. 
I'm not saying that any of this has been easy, but it has been most certainly shaped me into the person I am today. I know her life was taken away from her too soon. This causes me to live each day of my life to the fullest. There are no guarantees in life, so I make the most of the path I have been given. I do it all for Logan and me. Unquote. <sighs> wow. That really tugs at your heartstrings, I have to admit. But what a brave, strong, smart woman she grew up to be. I am so proud of you, Bailey. So I think we can all agree this is a double whammy for DHS, in my opinion. I want to say that um, I love all of our caseworkers out there. Uh, most of you guys are amazing, and I appreciate what you do for our little ones. I feel that Christie's caseworker, Allison, was overzealous with her efforts, which is surprising because we often see the opposite, this family reunification stance that goes on. But then again, I only have a portion of the story of what's been released, so I, I don't know if there's more to the story. You guys tell me what you think about this, them taking Christie's children from her. I could go either way. I can understand they want to protect her because I know a lot of what happens in homes. I cover these cases and, you know, the, the, the red flags are there and Allison's seen them. But again, was she, again, way too overzealous? Because on the other hand, I'm not saying there was, but there could be a kid around the block that's getting beat to death and they're calling 60 times and nobody comes and gets them. So it's so hard. It's so hard. My dog keeps barking. If you guys have heard my dog bark through here, my dog keeps barking. Let's leave a red heart in the comments for Logan and her amazing sister, just in case they ever stumble across this video. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button. Or there is a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Stories playlist for you to check out. Stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye. Bye.